Hello, everyone. Happy holidays. Today is December 16th, 2021. Welcome to In the Loop. I'm your host, John Pollard, Director of Education for Pricescope.com. We are the world's largest diamond and jewelry community, teaching consumers how to buy diamonds for more than 20 years. Pricescope attracts more than 400,000 unique visitors per month, and we list nearly a million diamonds from the world's most recognized, respected, and reputable online sellers. It's a collection of five-star rated companies known for honesty, best practices, and consumer protection. Our public forum has over 100,000 registered users, including an interactive community of jewelry enthusiasts who not only chat with each other, but willingly offer education and advice to new shoppers for no compensation, simply because our community likes diamonds, they like jewelry, and they like helping other people. If you're not yet a member, we invite you to register today and join the Price Scope community. Before we begin today, we would like to recognize a longtime member of the community who recently passed away. Our friend Peter, who posted his dancing fire, was a constant contributor for the past 17 years, sharing his time and knowledge to help consumers, sustaining friendships with other members, and regularly stirring the price scope pot with his unique brand of humor. As one of our other members observed, we can always think of DF in the sky with diamonds. On behalf of everyone who knew him, we wanted to say thank you, Peter, for the wonderful dancing fire you brought to price scope. Our In The Loop webinar is designed to bring you information, but it's also interactive. We invite you to send in questions during the session. We'll select some of those and address them before it concludes. If there are questions we don't get to, we'll follow up afterwards with an email. My guest today has more than a half century of diamond and jewelry industry experience. He holds a graduate gemologist degree with the Gemological Institute of America, is a certified senior member of the National Association of Jewelry Appraisers, a former master gemologist appraiser with the ASA and certified gemologist with the American Gem Society. He created a widely used AGA, NAJA cut class parametric grading system. He served the ethics chairman for the accredited gemologists, uh, gemologists association rather, and the National Association of Jewelry Appraisers, the largest specialty group for jewelry appraisal in the United States. During his career, he's instructed courses for many professional entities, and served as a gemological consultant for the Federal Trade Commission, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the United States Customs, the Internal Revenue Service, and the Smithsonian Institution. He is the president of D Atlas and Company Inc. and the concierge lead for Price Scope. He is David Atlas. Dave, welcome and thank you for being here. Unmute. Yes, thank you for. Uh give me such a great introduction. I, you've done your research. Which well, you're, easy, you're, good. you're easily found and I'm, I'm not going to be able to match you in authenticity uh, with this cap on, but I'll gladly serve as an elf to your Santa, Dave. Okay. We can always use another elf. Times are tough up here at the North Pole. <laughs> so how are things? How are you doing today? I am doing fine. Uh, Nice, uh, nice day where I live. It's kind of uh, the normal, uh, what's become of normal winter. It's uh, 60 degrees outside in Maryland. Not bad. That's not bad at all. Um, we have three sections today. We're going to start by talking about the past. Then we're going to jump to the future. And then finally, we're going to roll into the present with some, some tips and advice. But I wanted to start with the past. Dave, could you tell us a bit about your family's lineage in the jewelry industry, uh, starting, I believe, before the 1900s. Yeah, my my grandfather uh, had some job arranged with uh, a jeweler uh, in Paris, and uh, because they lived in tough circumstances in Western Russia, uh, when he was 12 years old, he left home in, in from Shepetovka in Russia and walked to Paris on his own. I imagine there were other people on the road at that time because it was a bad time there in Russia. Uh, and he had a job in Paris. He made his tools to make jewelry. Uh, he became a, a journeyman jeweler. 
He got a job in London. He went to London. He, he became a better jeweler and a, a stone setter. And eventually in the 1890s, uh, emigrated to Philadelphia. And, and within a couple of years of that, opened his own company, D. Atlas and Company, and uh, made jewelry primarily uh, for other retail jewelers. He was a uh, just a, a manufacturer. He had very little education, and he certainly didn't speak English real well at the time. But he was learning, and uh, eventually uh, became successful. And uh, in the early uh, 1900s, before the uh, World War One, he and uh, Louis uh, Baumgold, who was a, an early diamond dealer uh, and innovator in uh, New York City, they took a steamship and visited uh, Antwerp. And at that time, uh, they were gone probably a month or six weeks uh, between the time of travel and buying things. And they were a couple of the earliest people to bring diamonds back to the United States from overseas. And so that's really what he got into in the 20s. He was a, a major diamond source for at least the Philadelphia market. Well, that's interesting. And it, it dovetails uh, in Philadelphia with what was going on really with Pierre Cartier, uh, at essentially the same exact time uh, establishing Cartier in, uh, in New York. Um, and so at that time, I imagine D Atlas being such a, a longstanding company, uh, it clearly became the family business. Can you talk a little about the transition and, and your earliest memories? Well, I, I got there uh, when my dad was operating the business, uh, who he had come in uh, in the 30s. And I got there in 1967. Uh, I'd had all I could stand of going to college and I just wanted to get to work. And so uh, it was a good time for me to do that. And he gave me uh, latitude. I, I went to work for a bench jeweler for s several years and became a reasonably decent jeweler. But my uh, jeweler teacher told me that I would never be uh, Michelangelo and that I ought to work for my father. And so that's what I did. I, I around 72, 73, I really transitioned into uh, the wholesale jewelry and diamond business, colored stones, estate jewelry. Uh, we did it all. Uh, and because I had so much bench experience, I knew a lot about the manufacturing side and we increased that uh, over the next several years uh, into some really interesting antique reproduction type things. So we had a, a nice mix of new, new old looking jewelry and old jewelry as well, along with brand new fashionable modern jewelry. We did, did all of those things. Just marking the fact that you've literally seen most of the trends that any of us can remember. You've seen them emerge, you've seen them become popular, and then you've seen where they go. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that in the next section. But before we get to that section, I'm super interested in the your uh, your appraisal CV is it's very very rich it's very robust as I said in, in the intro um, you know you've been a consultant for entities at the pot, the highest possible level uh, and I'm interested in what made you choose a path to go as an appraiser. Well, my father was trained as an appraiser. Uh, in 1957, they invited him uh, to join Marcus and Company to be trained as an appraiser because they wanted to open a branch in the Philadelphia uh, department store that was known as Gimbals. And that was the least department uh, of retail jewelry in the downstairs of the store. And they wanted to add the same capability they had in New York City at Macy's, which was jewelry appraising. Uh, so they trained him for a year in New York City and then sent him down to Philly. He opened up uh, a department on the second floor that was just jewelry appraising and really uh, put a good mind to it. He had a lot of background. He had his graduate gemologist diploma from, I think, 1953 or 54 uh, that uh, 
had given him so much more knowledge than the average guy in the wholesale jewelry business. So uh, if he was, not to interrupt, but I think this is really important. If he was getting that credential in the time frame you're referring to, did he know Robert Shipley? Uh, he, he must have known him, uh, but only in passing. Uh, Robert Shipley was uh, not, you know, he, my dad did not, I don't know that my dad attended the GIA. I don't think they had the classes that they okay. certainly have now. He did it by correspondence. Uh, and so his diploma, though, has Shipley's signature and Dick Litico's signature on it. Oh, wow. And there was another one that I knew, an, AG, uh, an AGS uh, principal uh, for many years as well, other than Shipley, who was a co-signer of that report, okay, uh, that, so that uh, diploma. Yeah, for, for the audience, uh, just to mention by way of passing, so Robert Shipley is the father of gemology, and he basically established the grading system that is internationally used when we say D color for, you know, D, E, and F are colorless, et cetera. Um, he, he was really responsible for that. And then um, Dave mentioned Richard Liddicote. If we were going to compare this to football, it's like we're talking about Vince Lombardi and Tom Landry. Right. I mean, um, it's these are these are icons and luminaries uh, in the field. Um, so, Dave, so your father clearly is brushing shoulders. The other thing I love about this is the Philly v. New York connection. I already talked about how you got Atlas going on in the Philadelphia scene and Cartier and others going on up in New York. And then you just talked about Macy's and Gimbel's. So really just some interesting tale of two cities stuff going on there between the, the two metroplexes. Oh yeah, yeah. When when we would go to New York, which was at least every week and sometimes twice a week, uh, my dad had a long list of people to go visit, and uh, he came from out of town, so you know, new blood. You need new people as customers all the time, and uh, he was welcomed in some of the the nicest places in New York, and they recognized that he wasn't a competitor as well, uh, so. They gave him a different kind of treatment than someone who's your next door neighbor that you don't want to show him your trade secrets. Uh, he often got uh, the opportunity to participate in things either as a partner or an investor or to buy something that they didn't want to sell in New York City. Uh, we bought all kinds of things uh, that came out of... Uh, uh, quiet sales behind the scenes to raise cash for things. We got opportunities where people didn't want their jewelry to be shown around New York anymore. Wow. Really nice opportunities. Yeah, and it's the camaraderie there. Uh, first of all, I can say, if you look at the outside of the diamond and jewelry business looking in, it's a very, very competitive industry. And there's no doubt we do see some negative elements of that. But I will say I'm not very surprised to hear you say that your pop was in circles where even though there was competition, there was still mutual respect and understanding. Um, you know, we've seen that actually in the price scope community. It's a good example. We've seen that among the longstanding price scope sellers uh, for years and years. I mean, they, they compete with each other, certainly. But at, at industry trade events, you still see all these principles gathering, uh, hanging together. And, and it's, I think there's great respect when there is uh, recognizable talent uh, and integrity. So tribute to your, first of all, tribute to your father. I wanna get into your situation here. Um, you've done so much, you've seen so much. We had a couple of questions that came in ahead of time. And I would like to ask them on behalf of community members who submitted them. Um, first of all, uh, in terms of appraising, and for anybody who doesn't know, appraising is taking and analyzing uh, a piece of jewelry uh, or, you know, whatever's being appraised. The question is this, what was your most surprising or shocking appraisal? I think the, there was a time where we had a, a customer come in, someone we really didn't know. Uh, and he had come in for what the public often call an appraisal, and we discovered that really what he had was some minor items of jewelry that he wanted to sell. And a lot of people will call uh, making an offer an appraisal, which is okay with us. 
as long as we know which way we're headed, we don't care what they how they define the word. And we always did buy jewelry. Well, we bought a few things from the this couple, and uh, they were glad to get the money. They had some financial issues, and uh, as they were leaving, the wife said, "Oh, what about that 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 uh, ring that we had? We wanted to show them." And so he took out a, a big ring and a big round stone in a ring. And my dad looked at it. And I looked at it. And we said, well, what do you want to know about it? Well, is it anything? And it turned out it was a 12 karat diamond. And with two giant baguettes in it. And they were like thunderstruck. Uh, their daughter had been playing with grandma's uh, imitation ring for the last three years and kept it in her uh, toy box. <laughs> and these were people who had come up on, along on hard times and it was worth uh, close to $30,000. And they just couldn't believe their good luck with their, what they were hearing. I mean, it, it was something I don't think I'll ever forget. That's amazing. And you know, what's funny is we hear time and time again, and I'm sure you've had dozens and dozens of examples where somebody brings in something and wants you to analyze it and tell them what kind of a gemstone it is. And it's, it's fake. It's not a gemstone at all. Yeah. So that's a, that's a really cool uh, reverse story. And I'm real glad to hear it worked out for the family. Another question that came in um, before we move on to, to trends uh, was this. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, Dave is our concierge lead on PriceScope. What that means is if you were to go to the landing page and find the connect with an expert option, uh, you can actually send requests to Dave for assistance with projects. Uh, and this could be anything. It could be for a, a pair of studs or it could be help me find like a Colombian emerald. Whatever it is, Dave's there to look into these requests and use his resource to be able to connect people with the, with the right solutions. So the other question here, Dave, with that understood is in the time that you've done it, what is the weirdest concierge request that uh, you've had? No names, please. <laughs> You know, I don't want to. I don't want to tell any tales. The truth is that the request for the concierge uh, from the uh, the on-site uh, ability to do that has not generated any weird requests. It's entertaining if it would. I, I'm sure now that I'm asking for it, I'm going to get some. Uh, but I don't have a tale of of weird yet. Uh, maybe it's partly because I've heard so many different tales, nothing seems as weird as it might be. Uh, I, I, I just, I knew you might ask it because I reviewed the questions that were uh, posted on the forum. Uh, and I, I can't think of anything that was strange. Uh, there were, what I will say is that there have been lots of requests that really were, please encourage me to do the searching that I need to do for myself because you really don't appreciate what you've found unless you've done a little bit of uh, work to get it. If somebody hands it to you, there's a suspicion that there's an agenda behind it. If I give you the tools though, to go and search and you discover something, then you don't believe you've been led to the wrong item. And I think that the credibility is better from our standpoint, from PriceScope's standpoint, and also the value of PriceScope is also better understood by doing those kind of searches. So that's the way I'm encouraging it. I'm encouraging it by learning, uh, encouraging learning, uh, which is my long to my 22 year goal with PriceScope is to, is to give knowledge back to the consumer. Uh, not just to hand it to them on a, a plate, then they think, well, something suspicious about being told these two diamonds are the best ones. Yeah, well, I, so this is a perfect segue, in fact, um, because when you mentioned Price Scope, our community here is acutely focused on cut. 
Um, and of course, quality in all areas, authenticity in all areas and transparency among sellers, et cetera. But the one thing you'll find, and it was funny, I, I read in a, in a forum post the other day, you know, majority of the world's diamonds are not going to pass the price scope, quote unquote, standards. Um, and there's a number of reasons that that may or may not be the case. I don't think it's it's the the grail for every single person. And we do want to talk again to get into trends. We do want to talk a little bit about this um, in terms of cut. Like, does the average consumer really strive for it? So let's move into the second topic. Okay, we're talking about new trends, and I mentioned that you've seen the marquee craze come and go. And you've seen the the sixty sixty Fuhrer and all of that take over and sweep the world. You've seen the you know different um, multifaceted cuts uh, come around, and then you've seen um, different brands which may have come and persisted for a while or have not been around for a while. So, as it relates to this, in terms of the future, do you believe? And I, by the way, for all the old cut lovers, we're going to get to that too. So just so you know, but I want to talk about the cut quality situation on price scope. Do you believe that the consciousness that is prevalent on the forum amongst the veteran members here on price scope is something that will spread ultimately and become better known in mainstream channels? Or is it something that's just going to remain kind of niche and quiche for price scope? There's not all that many vendors that sell super ideal diamonds. There's a small number of vendors that sell them, relatively small number. Uh, there's another group of vendors that sell diamonds that are close to the super ideals. And that may be as far as they care to go in terms of the degree of perfection of cut, because they couldn't possibly supply themselves 20 times more stones if they wanted to. It just wouldn't be financially feasible for them. They want to sell diamonds. They don't want to look at them in the inventory. So, uh, that's, that so it's up. a little bit better for them to sell nearly a, a perfection stone. Okay, so let's let's tap the brakes on on quote unquote super ideal for a minute. Let me just go back to uh, a diamond that has really robust light behavior. Okay, um, yeah. we can we can call it uh, diamonds that pass the HCA. That's the standard price scope test. So for reference, let's just say that it's a it's a it's a it's a top HCA performer, sure. meaning it gets HCA excellent. Now, what I'm seeing, and I'm not just talking about e-commerce. Uh, and so by way, I, I was asked to lend some of my opinion, my experience here as well. And I'm not gonna steal Dave's thunder because he's the OG, but I will say that I've had the good fortune uh, to travel the world and to be able to be a specialist on cut quality specifically in a number of different markets for a number of different professional organizations and um, directly teaching in stores to independent jewelry stores that actually do have a high value on cut quality. And I'll just say this, the average jeweler in my experience, if the term for the cut is quote unquote excellent, they're really not looking much beyond that. So I guess my question, if I can rephrase the question, Dave, is do you believe there will be a time when there's going to be a higher standard for the average jeweler than just looking at the label excellent? It's a good question. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, I think as, as the definition becomes broader, more, the stores that are going to survive the, uh, the competition with the internet, the ones that either decide to participate in an active way with the internet or to go in their own direction in a strong way, uh, they will have a better defined idea of what excellent is. Uh, the HCA is, is a component of that, I believe, with the round stones. And I do think that uh, developing uh, accepted standards on fancy cuts, at least the ones that are in the popular realm, 
uh, is crucial to getting more well-cut stones into the market. But one of the things that I used to remind people that I was developing uh, automatic grading tools with years ago was that they had to keep in mind the, the very high cost of rough material and the unusual nature of what makes fancy shapes versus rounds, why you cut a pear shape or a marquee. Uh, it isn't because it would make a fine round. It's because it won't. And that rough still costs a lot of money and you have to plan so that you get an attractive stone from what nature gave you. It's interesting that you bring that up and just for the, for the attendees, uh, most rough, I'm gonna say the word most, I should probably just say a lot of rough, uh, is either octahedral or dodecahedral in nature. It's very well, it, a round or a cushion shape, uh, it's very suitable. You can get usually two rounds or, or two cushions um, out of the what I would call the standard rough. Then we have rough that is damaged uh, over millions of years. It's been cut in two, it's cleaved. Um, we call them makeables, we call them splittables. It's rough that's not gonna really be suitable for a round. And most of the world's fancy shapes come from broken rough like that or, or mackles, which is another, another type of, uh, of rough. But the point that Dave is making is exactly that. There's not the motivation in fancy shapes, never has been, to, to really try and innovate uh, cut quality standards because they're not standardized like the round brilliant is with with the the angles and the dangles. But I th I thought that was super insightful, Dave. You're right. There's until there is the chance to really improve what's happening in fancies, then rounds are already like by definition they already have a cut grade. So there is some threshold of assessment that people are just going to point to and go, you know, that's it. And then. The hi-fi audio files of diamonds on price scope will continue to point at the better better. Um, I will tell you this, uh, just to wrap up this section, we're going to get to antique cuts because I know our audience wants to hear about that. Um, but I will tell you this, there are literally dozens of independent jewelers who use the HCA when they are ordering diamonds in from suppliers. So, Let's talk for a moment about antique cuts, Dave, if you can just talk about the rise in their popularity. Well, uh, when I came into the business, my father was actively buying diamonds from the public and from diamond sellers. Uh, we were making new jewelry. So of course we were buying small diamonds, we were buying big diamonds, we were putting them into things. We bought modern cuts. Uh, primarily, that's what we. my father would buy, modern diamonds. He would buy an old diamond from uh, an individual that would come in and want to sell something, and he knew what to do with it. Frequently, he would get it recut to a modern diamond, or he would sell it to a diamond dealer and turn it over for a little profit and go on. Uh, I made friends with a jeweler near, near us on Jewelers Row who had lots and lots of lots of filigree solitaire rings, just buckets of them, uh, where he had sold the diamonds, but he had saved the bounties. And because I had manufacturing experience, he let me go through those buckets. And for a while, I was buying those old bounties and putting the old diamonds in them. And we were giving them out on memo to stores around the country. Uh, and then I realized, you know, each one of those was a one of a kind. And so I inquired as to how this could be manufactured. And it turned out that if I would take, take them and fix them up a little bit, I could often have them silver plated a little bit heavier and make a rubber mold. And then we could cast them and we could make as many as we wanted. So I started to develop a collection of uh, filigree dinner rings and filigree princess rings and solitaires or nearly solitaire rings, all different filigrees. And then I would try to buy old cut diamonds, uh, not only from the public, but from dealers in New York City when I'd go, that would fit in the rings. I tried to buy diamonds that, that looked okay, that would fit. I wasn't much concerned with their cut. I was concerned that they should look white enough because no one bought 
the type of colored diamonds that are selling today at Old Stones. Uh, but I would go down to K or L color uh, and pretty much any clarity. And I put those stones in there and they would sell like crazy. So uh, it became a business and my father was appalled. He just couldn't believe that people would buy uh, reproduction mountings with old crummy diamonds. They weren't really great. Uh, but they did. They People liked them. Well, to go on, I knew that people liked them, and there was no regular market for them. They, they, no one was publishing prices. Uh, this is in the late 70s where prices on diamonds were going to the moon. Uh, and by about 1981, 82, I really was buying them. Uh, and understood what I could pay. And uh, the fellow that, that owned, that did own GCAL, the lab in New York City, Don Palmieri, asked me if I could print a price guide for him. He has a, had or has a publication that uh, listed uh, colored stone prices and diamond prices, uh, much like the gem guide does. And, uh, I did. I, I took a Rappaport sheet and I made my own spreadsheet and I put discounts into the Rappaport prices. And so for the limited number of diamonds that I did find, I extrapolated from that and made prices on the whole range of Rappaport diamonds. Uh, and, and he published it. And all of a sudden I became Mr. Old Miner. Uh, that's why where my uh, nickname on PriceScope came from. Uh, and, and people thought I knew everything about old cut stones. What I knew is that they would sell if I could only buy them. Uh, and so he published it for a while. And then uh, Richard Drucker of The Guide in uh, Chicago, who was uh, more well known, asked me if I could be one of the advisors on his price board and publish those, those prices with him. And I agreed. So of course, Tom Palmieri got a little bit annoyed with me and threw me out. And so I published in the guide for a while. Uh, and now Michael Goldstein does the same thing in the guide. Uh, I used to buy a lot of stones from Mike and, and Mike said to me, what are you doing with those? And I told him, and he said, you think I could do that? And I said, of course you could do it. It wouldn't bother me. Uh, you know, it's a big world out there. And so I kind of encouraged him to do it. And being in New York, he did it a bigger way. He, he started to buy larger diamonds. And uh, it became a real business for him. And I gradually uh, wished it well and sold him my inventory as I kind of pushed away from uh, big inventory. And uh, he's still doing old cut diamonds. That's great. So yeah. it, it explains the uh, the old miner moniker. So that's, yeah. that's kind of cool to have that story. Um, and and it's by the way, as we know. So this is the beautiful thing about the gemstone world, and I'm talking about all gemstones, but we're going to talk diamond specific. Is you have the super high fi technical people who really like the just the, the the craftsmanship and precision of the of the super ideal cuts and by the way uh, just so everybody knows our definition of super ideal price scope does have a definition it's on the uh, cut page in the education uh, area so we do have a definition of that then we also have people who love step cuts and ashers and the charm i think antique cuts for me it's kind of a mix of both those things. You know, you still, with most of the antique cuts, you still have these big, bold flashes. Um, and at the same time, it's a completely different taste than the modern round. Uh, and it's a different taste than, you know, we can get into the 60-60 and, you know, diamonds with high crowns and this and that. And it's interesting that we've seen appreciation for all of these uh, different things in the price scope community, which I think really reflects what I see when I walk into a jewelry store, which is one person's not going to like what the next person's going to like and the next person's going to like. And it's nice to be able to represent that, that type of diversity here. 
Um, I did have a question come in and we're going to save uh, if we have other questions. I know we have a few preloaded ones that I have to ask you as we get into our next section. Uh, but a uh, question just came in and I think it's perfect for right now. You've just talked about an awful lot of, of since the beginning here of things you've done. It's going to be hard to narrow it down perhaps, but the question uh, is what is the favorite ring that you've ever seen in person? Let me broaden that well, ring and then and then peace as well. I really I saw a ring recently that uh, a person in the business showed me, and, and I had never seen one like it. And it it made it was very striking, and it, it had diamonds in it. But unfortunately, the main the main well the main stone was a marquee diamond, and it was a beautiful white looking stone with lots of. Uh, sparkle and not a big bow tie. It, it, it was beautiful on its own. It was surrounded by emerald calibrate, emeralds that were cut to fit in a channel all the way around it. And then there was uh, additional calibrate emeralds in the, the shank, and they were surrounded with diamonds. It was just a, a work of art. And I think they believed that the ring was old. And Part of the things that I do now for the trade are, are look at items and decide whether they're really antiques or if they're reproductions. Uh, it isn't always easy to figure out something. But this had something I'd never seen. It had calibre, but they were, and they were emerald calibre, but they were cabochons. Oh. Each one was kind of a bread loaf, a, a, a loaf shape. Not sugar loaf, not the pointed tops, but yeah. Uh, just, just to make tops. sure that our just to make sure that our attendees know, a cabochon is it's a domed top essentially. It's it's yeah. it's a round. Wow, that's something else. Uh, and they were beautifully fitted. It wasn't as if uh, they took a hammer and chiseled two of them to fit together. These were cut exactly to fit and in a, a curving shape. Uh, so that this was really a, an artistic endeavor that somebody did. And when I turned it upside down, the segments of the ring were joined by wires. Now, this was a filigree dinner ring. Well, this had wires underneath joining certain elements. Uh, and to me, it looked like it had been uh, laser assembled, that you just couldn't get that close to the color with that kind of heat unless it was lasered. It looked like it was an assembled, brand new product. Absolutely gorgeous, though. I, I, and I've never seen anything like it. And then a few months later, don't I get another one? And that wasn't emeralds. It was cabochon sapphires with a different shaped diamond in the center. So it was a, a handmade ring, but made exactly the same. With same, so, same, same source, I presume? Pardon? From the same source? Both well, these rings? it came from somebody who was taking it on memo from a dealer, I think. Okay. And so I guess it was from the same source. And the, the sapphires had the same thing with the curved wires underneath. Very distinctively the product of one particular uh, metal smith. You don't know who. There's no marks in it. But something about the way it was made, well... Never in a lifetime do you see two rings made wow. that way unless they're reproduced from six months ago or a year ago. They just, they just don't exist in, in uh, estate jewelry. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, um, that leads me into, I've got another couple questions and then we're going to get into our last section here. Uh, and I, I'm going to come back because we had a couple of preloaded questions about the old cuts. But while we're on this topic, this, this unique uh, you know, what I would say is sort of like a celebrity piece almost. Um, did want to ask the question because it was asked uh, ahead of time. Do you feel like for all the press that they get, when you see celebrity engagement rings out in the news, do they really affect what consumers wind up looking at and buying? Well, there are some consumers that are certainly going to... Uh be really excited about what celebrities are getting. Uh, 
you don't get to be a celebrity unless you have an audience. Uh, so yeah, whatever they do uh, does have an effect on uh, future trends. Uh, some of those diamonds are, are beautiful. Uh, they usually are uh, very limited in supply because they're really, really, really expensive. Uh, but it does have an effect. I, I, I would think that the, the, the big ovals that some people are getting are going to have an effect on what people might look for. Uh, if you look for a really fine oval, it's going to be a good, a good hard thing to look for. And very hard to confirm until you have it at home in your own lighting and decide that it looks the way you want it to look. Because you can put all the parameters together uh, numerically and still come out with a diamond you personally might not particularly like in your lighting. Uh, if you want to see really fantastic looking ovals and make you think that they're common, if you look at a lab, a series of lab diamonds, you'll see lots of ovals that look fantastic because the rough is inexpensive and it's it's kind of made to order to make ovals. Yeah, that's true. It's it's true. Yeah. Rough. C CBD rough is absolutely perfect for shallow shapes. So in back to that question though, so let's ask this, like if J-Lo, if her famous pink diamond had dropped in this day and age, do you think we'd see a surge in light box pinks going out? If the beers had it in their head to make expensive pinks uh, and make them fabulous looking, they could do it. And there's probably a market for it. But I think they have it in their mind that can put the control dampers on the lab process by keeping their product an inexpensive product and cutting it respectably. And of course, there is no reason that their ovals have to look bad, and they probably don't. If they wanted to make an oval, they could make it. Yeah, it's it's really mind blowing. And as as we're talking about trends here, um, you know, we could do an entire hour just on what's going on in terms of of, of lab grown and how that's influencing um, fashion decisions at an affordability level, but not just that, it's also informing decisions about natural diamonds and natural diamond value. It's, it's super interesting. Um, need to wrap this section though, we need to keep moving. So the last two questions, um, and you may have addressed this a little bit, so feel free to, to address this as much or as little as you wish. Do old cuts need to truly be old to be desirable or are newly polished in the style of old cuts, usually better diamonds? Well, there was a time where a newly cut old cut really wasn't competitively priced with an actual old, old cut because the old cut enters the market at whatever price dealers want to buy it for and doesn't usually get to or didn't usually get to the full retail price of a modern diamond uh, and you can't do anything with an old cut uh, that is just made last week the rough costs what a new piece of rough costs and the labor is expensive so they're they're relatively expensive it's guaranteed uh, however the popularity of of older cuts, uh, in many cases, has made those old cuts work just about the same, even the premium sometimes, uh, depending on quality. Uh, the only place where a secondhand old cut suffers is when it's really a great color and a great clarity, right near the top. Uh, I owned a, a two and a half or three carat old cut for a long time that was uh, E or F color and I think VBS2. And it was a nice stone. It didn't have any issues. It, it, it was wonky enough for some people and uh, symmetr symmetrical enough for others. 
Uh, it didn't have any dead spots. It had lots of big light flashes. Everything was nice. But the truth is, it's really, really hard to sell one for more than G color and VS1 or VS2. And so in the end, that's what it sold for. It sold for less. Uh, had it been uh, an MN color, an SI1, it would have probably brought a premium over a modern stone. Yeah, that, now that makes a lot of sense and it explains the popularity of, of some of those colors in the near colorless and just below range. Yeah. Um, so we want to get into uh, the last uh, section, basically some, some just some tips and some advice uh, from an appraisal standpoint, from a protection standpoint, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in terms of insurance and appraisals. Can you touch on that topic? And by the way, before I have you answer, I do want to mention we're still accepting questions uh, in the chat. And if our attendees don't mind, if sometime you can just drop in the chat your city, state, or country, we're just interested in where people are watching from. So Dave, back to you, appraisal insurance. I, I try to, to find out where my clients are buying so that I can give them appropriate appraised value based on the way they prefer to buy. If I have people that are buying from their local, the local store, <coughs> I try to get into the markup range that a retail store would use. If I know they're dedicated to buying a diamond from the internet, how much more than what the internet price is, is really necessary. Uh, you want to be able to make a replacement. You don't want to give the insurance company an, an extra 20 or 30 or 40 percent premium every year if you're an honest person and you're not going to go out of your way to lose that diamond. Uh, the chances are slim that you'll ever have a loss. So by the time you have it for 10 or 15 years, you paid for the stone again. Uh, you have to use a little bit of judgment. On the other hand, the appraiser is told by all legitimate sources all the time, you're not forecasting the future. Don't give people what we call feel-good reports that make them think they got the bargain of their lifetime uh, by making them pay extra insurance year after year after year for no good reason other than just to feel good. Uh, it isn't really correct. But here we find ourselves in an unusual period of inflation uh, where I don't want to leave anybody in a position where I'm right today and wrong in six months. You don't want the appraisal to expire that soon. So I use uh, 10 to 20 percent range above what they've paid as a reasonable buffer uh, for what may be foreseeable inflation, but I just, I can't promise it's going to happen. Well, I think you just gave away some secret sauce there. I was going to try to pin you on the mat and get you to give me a number like that, because it's really, it's a delicate balance. And it is, and it is there is some sweet spot between what you paid and a feel good, there's a sweet spot in there somewhere that's right. And I need to also state, back me up here or contradict me if I'm wrong. This is also somewhat regional, isn't it? In the Midwest, it may be different than in the Northeast. Well, there are places that are far less competitive. Uh, there's places where there's 100 miles and there's no jewelry store uh, around you. And those stores are able to charge a traditional retail price to people that have lived and know and lived in the area for their lifetimes. The store owners have lived there for their lifetimes or their family goes back generations. Uh, people are not worried that it's an investment. They're buying something to give as a gift. It's romantic. They're buying something they can afford and they don't care. Uh, there, there's no harm in that. Uh, but people in big cities are so uh, under the gun for everything. Uh, they're pressured, not only financially, but they, they're peer pressured into shopping uh, 
online, uh, buying something as large as they can buy. Uh, well, at some point, you want the lowest markup you can obtain, too. And, and so many people have uh, mathematical backgrounds and engineering backgrounds, science-driven, uh, and they know better than to buy something that doesn't have the right numbers, that doesn't sparkle the right way. Uh, they don't have a relationship with a jeweler, so their relationship is with money. And uh, they, they want to buy things at the right price. So you have to, I have to, by the way they buy, where they live, uh, how they think, uh, that's my job is to kind of interview people to uh, try to uh, have communication with them uh, as to their method of possible replacement. And also when I make a report, the wording that I put into the report not only covers my anatomy, it covers uh, the discussion that we had. Uh, so that they will have, they and I both have uh, a remembrance inside that report as to the conversation that took place. And do you want to say a word about jewelry specific uh, insurers as opposed to um, uh, riders on homeowners and et cetera? Uh, the homeowner's policies are fine if you own a home, you want a homeowner's policy, it probably won't cost you more than it costs for uh, Jewelers Mutual or any of the others that are doing this. If you have, if you're a high wealth individual and you have Chubb, you have a fabulous company. I don't think anybody beats them. Uh, Lloyds of London certainly at the top end for out people outside the U.S. Uh, you have to watch out for automatic increases that are graciously given to you by your insurer. They're a little bit self-serving sometimes. It does keep you from meeting uh, an appraisal as often. However, uh, I've seen instances where certain things uh, have gone up for a long period for a period of time, and the people took the insurance rider increase automatically for years. Uh, and then they found out that the item, this was not diamonds, this was like South Sea pearls, that the pearls had gone down in value over a period of time as well. And the insurance company kept raising them up 5% a year. Right. And so a okay. $100,000 strand of pearls became $230,000, and now they're worth 15000 or 20000 They really, really uh, not self-serve or was self-serving to the insurance company to do it. Although in their defense, if you lost it, they would write you a check for everything you had insured it for. Yeah, I remember this. Um, so that's okay. Thank you, by the way. It's a good overview. And the insurance topic here again, we can do an entire session on, yeah. on insurance, but we need to move along. We do have another couple of questions that have come in. And as we approach the end of our session here, if anybody wants to drop more questions in the chat or the Q&A, that's fine. Um, first of all, uh, this is not so much question as an observation. So Dave, one of your passion projects was to try and get some parametric information out there for fancies, just some guideline. And it's so difficult. And, and anybody who's been in the business understands it's a tremendous challenge. And for if anybody's inexperienced, fancies just simply cannot be predicted like rounds because there are so many more variables with fancies, like full stop. But Dave has been on the on the forefront of helping with that. And I did want to mention that price scope is is closing in on a looks like for fancy shapes, like in terms of a just basic spread assessment. Like if I have this cushion, should it be this many millimeters, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But Dave, real quickly, just talk about that for a minute. And then I do have one final question for you. Well, I'm going to keep it general because I am. I, I'm absolutely waiting to, to, to see what price scope does come up with. But I, I will tell you that I took a lot of abuse for having put out some metrics over the years. Uh, I, I, you know, I would look like I'm 50 instead of uh, 75 uh, if I hadn't taken all that abuse. Uh, and it was entertaining because I knew I was right in many respects. And I also knew that it wasn't perfect. 
but I will say in my defense, and I, I think people will tend to agree, when there are standards that have been agreed upon, every one of those fancies that's defined will have certain limits to length, width ratios. They'll have certain limits to their depth ratio, depth to uh, width ratios. Uh, they'll have table sizes that were within certain ranges, crown heights within certain ranges. And that all you need to do is measure those to establish uh, the from and the to measurement. And you'll have some parameters that are part and parcel of those great shapes. And that's what I tried to do. Uh, it isn't acceptable uh, to do that without uh, automation, which I did have done. However, it was imperfect. It just, it just I wasn't that much of a computer guru to do it. I didn't have enough stones to sample from. But when somebody has done enough looking, Someday there will be sets of measures that uh, pretty well define a, a, a beautiful diamond of all the shapes. And I just hope I live to see it. That is awesome. Uh, and not only should you, but you should be, in my opinion, uh, uh, somebody who's an elder statesman of overseeing and, and checking that. I would just say my opinion is you should be involved at some level of oversight. Um, Final thing, uh, and I, I have my own input here. I'm an education specialist. That's what I do. Uh, the question is, uh, are there any standout diamond education or gemology course providers considered competitive to GIA and fairly well-known uh, in the industry? Dave, I'll let you take it first. There are, there's a couple uh, that are a couple places to do it. Certainly the the uh, Gemological Association of Great Britain yep. uh, does fantastic gemology. There's a couple of private individuals that do it with with names that I don't I don't really want to promote or not promote any of them. But when you get a diploma from them, it, it it's a little bit like having a diamond certificate from Dave Atlas. It isn't nearly the same as a GIA report. Uh, and it doesn't garner asking, hang on, asking about schools specifically, about education schools. Well, Diamond Council of America has been yes. in it for a number of years, and I don't think they have anything shameful to re, uh, about them. I think there's value there uh, in their in their education systems. Uh, Accredited Gemologist Association is a wonderful place if you're already a GG or an FGA. Uh, to continue to add to your education. Uh, and it's really unusual to have advanced education bid offered. I would, I would add, uh, yeah, the, you know, the American Gem Society has their, their training program as well. Um, I, I would just say this, and this is just my observation, and this is, I would consider my area of specialty. Um, there is nothing that is serving the current need. Uh, when I say current need, I'm talking about latest developments. I'm talking about cut quality specifics, whether it is cut standards for antique cuts, whether it is cut standards for fancy shapes, whether it is the super dupers. There is not currently anything that is serving that niche, but I will say this, stay tuned. Good. With that, Dave, I think uh, we, are, we are at the witching hour here. Um, and uh, I, I really want to thank you, man. Um, and thanks to all the attendees we've had. I mean, nobody's dropped off. Everybody's been listening. So either they, they're off cooking in their kitchen and left their computers open, or you've been super interesting, my friend. Or they fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you very much for, uh, for first of all, for all of your contributions um, just uh, to this endeavor, this field that we all value so much, and for your contributions on PriceScope, Dave. When I was a young rookie on PriceScope, I used to read your posts with enthusiasm. So I uh, appreciate all you do, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go feed my reindeer now. All right. <laughs> you go do that. <laughs> and we'll see you later. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, by the way, everyone. you can go to Idealscope. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, DaveAtlas.com. Is it Datlas? Datlas.com. Okay. Uh, get your U.S. Uh, Idealscopes from me. <laughs>
Yes, absolutely. Um, That's your ideal scope from Dave. Um, and yeah, there you go. There's the commercial and uh, we'll see you later, guys.